the authority, passionate, magnetic, alpha, commanding, influencing, inspiring, persistent, positive, driven, successful. This is who we are as pros. This is Turning Pro Academy, your number one resource for creating the business, lifestyle, and freedom you want. Learn to build an epic life with the no BS, proven online business mastery. The real world advice and strategies used by the world's best so that you can live your dream. Welcome to the Turning Pro Academy. I am your host and your coach, Chris Dufay, and I'm giving you a very big thanks for being here with me right now. I know, I really do know there are more podcast choices than you can poke a stick at. So it makes me smile that you're here and seeing this podcast grow like it really is and having you along for the fun is why I'm really excited to keep this coming for you. And just like every other episode, this one is an absolute doozy and this one goes along with the subjects of you becoming an author and being able to step up well above your competition. This episode, we are highlighting and unveiling the insights into how Taylor Pearson is now a best-selling author that's just not selling a ton of books, but has boosted his business in multiple avenues and how you can be doing this and you and your business success is going to reap the rewards from it. Firstly, The End of Jobs, which is the book he's just released, is a must read. And we'll talk more about why in this episode. But for you, in this episode, we're unveiling how you can write your book, what the process of actually getting it out can be, some wise moves in how to market and sell the book even before you have finished writing it. And these nuggets of advice he gives are seriously worth it. Also, why there is tremendous power in you writing a book, even not just for the book sales, but to boost your credibility and authority and why apprentices and entrepreneurship is the best way and the how-tos for you to go about this. What you take away from today's episode, I know will have you more confident in charge and taking the right action. So strap yourself in as this is all about giving you the success that you want. And if you are loving this, then I would love for you to give an iTunes review for the Turning Pro Academy podcast. Right now, click on over, you can leave a review. If you're loving it, five stars would be mucho appreciated, but give me your honest feedback to eat up. Get in contact if you want me to bring on certain guests, if you want me to cover certain topics, certain unveiling on whatever it is that you want, tell me and I shall make it happen, unless it's just a very silly idea that I definitely won't. But I know that really you do love soaking in the audio and podcast. So if you're wanting to burn fat, build and transform your body, make sure you head on over, tune in and subscribe to the Fit Body Pro podcast over at fitbodypro.com. This is where I can give you the specially advanced proven strategies, plans and advice along with bringing on the world's best guests. It's all killer, no filler, making sure you avoid the frustration and confusion when it comes to your health and physique. So to really get the most out of you being here with me right now, get on over to turningproacademy.com. Right now waiting for you is a treasure trove of free guides, online workshops, and insights that are coming straight out of the Six Figure PT program. So don't be a peanut and miss out on these, as this is so I can show you how to double your clients or to start and build your online fitness business, or whether you wanna build your reputation, your following and career and business success, I'm giving the exact steps so you don't miss it. And along with the show notes and links from this episode and every other episode. So turningproacademy.com, it's where you're going to want to go head on over to. But now it's time to bring on Taylor as it was an absolute pleasure to see him last week over in Bangkok. Now we're, we're having a yarn so you can take up all the insights. Taylor, thank you very much for coming on to the Turning Pro Academy podcast, mate. You are a author extraordinaire. I was very um, privileged to watch you talk. Actually, it was what probably a bit over a week ago over in Bangkok, and you really kind of 
uh, dug up and threw out some golden nuggets for us and the other people sitting down watching you um, dish it up. So firstly, mate, before we really start unveiling everything, I just want to say a huge thank you for taking the time out for myself and the listener. No, thank you very much for having me and thank you everyone else for listening. I appreciate it. Awesome. Okay. So before we even go into the nitty gritty of everything, Taylor, let's let's start with the basics. Who is Taylor and why are you so phenomenal? <laughs> uh, so that'll be a difficult question to answer. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I guess my uh, short story background um, was planning on being a lawyer, um, realized that that was not exactly something that I was excited about doing with my life. Um, about five years ago, um, kind of transitioned and started cycling through careers. I was a medical interpreter for a little while. Um, I was an English teacher for a little while and eventually ended up getting into um, marketing initially through SEO and then kind of broader online marketing. And I spent most of the last three years um, doing some sort of online marketing consulting. And then over the past year, sat down and wrote a book, which was what we spoke about uh, a week ago. Um, and that book did um, much better than I initially expected. The marketing worked much better than I'd expected. Um, and it's opened a bunch of doors. So we were going to kind of chat a little bit about um, what that is and how that worked. All right, beautiful. And maybe even before we even start delving into that then, what brought you to actually write the book? Like what flicked the switch to be like, you know what, I actually really have to take this endeavor now and create this. So the premise of the book, uh, the one sentence summary is basically jobs are getting more competitive and less profitable and entrepreneurship is getting uh, safer, more accessible and more profitable for macroeconomic reasons. So there's like these big things going on that are actually making entrepreneurship um, a smarter, in my opinion, a smarter and safer life decision. Um, and so we were actually, the book started at the conference we were at a week ago. It started um, the conference, the same conference the previous year. So huh. sitting with all these dudes at a breakfast buffet after this business conference, um, you know, 250 entrepreneurs are in the room and we're kind of having this conversation. Like, you know, we have all these friends back in uh, Australia, back in the States, um, working jobs they're not particularly happy about. And they're very smart very hardworking people, um, but aren't really happy with the results. And we're looking at all these guys in Bangkok, Thailand at this entrepreneurs conference um, that aren't any smarter or, you know, any more hard work necessarily, but are getting a lot different results in their lives and kind of like, okay, why, why is this? Um, and why hasn't anyone explained what this is and what's going on? Um, and so that was, that's kind of the Genesis story. Okay. So a big part of what you were writing about is entrepreneurship really isn't the the weirdo kind of fad that was a little bit a while ago and it's really turning into something that it's more of a need than a choice than what's been going on as well and i think for myself as well i found out at a at a very early age i was pretty technically unemployable because i just didn't really want to have a boss per se and kind of wanted to run my own ship and kind of found out the hard way with that why do you think of the jobs are just completely becoming just redundant. So if you're going to look at um, what's gone on, um, and let me actually like wind the, the clock back a little bit. If you look at the way economies in the West have developed over the last 700 years, they tend to go through distinct phases. So um, you start in agricultural uh, and then you shift into industrial. And then over the course of the 20th century, we've shifted from industrial to what I would call like the knowledge of the service economy. Um, and I think, you know, we're now seeing this shift towards entrepreneurship. So I think this is kind of a natural progression. And as to like what specifically is driving this progression, um, the, the two things I kind of talk about in the book that are the big drivers are um, technology, specifically machines and um, outsourcing. That what's happened, especially over the last um, 10 years, like very, very quickly, very, very recently, um, is that kind of the rise of technology and the rise of um, other parts of the country have made jobs much more competitive that instead of people competing against other people kind of in their local mm. geographic area that if they are working on a computer um, they are competing with people from around the world uh, and more and more people that it, I can't try to remember the stat exactly um, but from you know the dawn of history until 2000 um, there were 90 million college graduates in the year 2000 uh, in 2010 that number was up to 140 million um, so like this 
the level of competition of people that are credentialed, well-educated, intelligent people uh, is going up very, very fast. Uh, and that kind of the scarce resource in my mind is not not people doing this knowledge work where you can get credentialed and someone else kind of tells you what to do and gives you the um, playbook, but where you have to make up the playbook yourself, yes. like kind of a much more entrepreneurial angle. I completely agree with you 100% with what you were saying, because my team is completely virtual, but it is about to change. But I find it interesting about the change that I'm actually about to pull the trigger on. And it goes exactly with something that you were talking about, which I really resonated with me when I was reading it was the idea of apprenticeships and the importance of this. But before we even delve into that, maybe I kind of like lure into what I'm doing. What flicked the switch with you with the power of apprentices? So I actually, that was kind of how I got my start. So I was, um, teaching English in Brazil and kind of like trying to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do with my life for lack of a better term. But I knew English teaching was not um, kind of the long-term career I was looking for. You can't, you can't really do much. There's not a lot of upward trajectory. Yep. Um, and so I was kind of looking for other opportunities. And so I initially, I started these like niche websites on the side and they were like, got to the point where they were making a few hundred and I think maybe a couple thousand bucks at one point, but it wasn't like a real business. It was basically, it's like SEO arbitrage where I'd figure out how to like rank some not so good sites um <laughs> and eventually they tanked as like you know karma is appropriate and they should have <laughs> um, and I, I kind of you know had this moment where i was like you know i need to go get in a situation um where i can see someone that understands this you know, i didn't i didn't grow up around a lot of entrepreneurs i can't point to anyone in my childhood that was an entrepreneur i didn't really understand what that even meant um and so i found two guys that were um running a product business out of San Diego, um, selling B2B equipment and basically said, Hey, look, you know, here's some websites I built. Um, I'm pretty good at this, you know, SEO and decent online marketing thing, but I don't really, you know, I don't have like products to sell and I'm kind of still trying to figure this out, but I can take this skill set, you know, and I've taught myself this and like, I'll come work on your business for it. And kind of the reverse is like, I get to play with your money. You know, I had, I went yeah. from having a few hundred dollars to, they said, okay, you know, I, I, we have 20 grand a month in online marketing. Like, you know, you get to decide how to do that budget. So I had, you know, $20,000 a month to like teach myself online marketing effectively, as long as they were getting positive ROI, and, yeah. you know, they were as they were, and you know, they were happy to, to make that trade with me. And so now I kind of discovered it because it was what I was looking for. Um, and so that was a very win-win relationship for me that I learned a lot. I got to, you know, train at altitude is the term I like to use instead of kind of working on small projects. I got to work on much, much bigger projects and create uh, much, much bigger results um, just because of access to resources. And I also learned a lot from working with them and working in the day-to-day -day of that company. Um, and so I'm actually uh, in the process of, I want to hire someone similar to that uh, for myself at this point. So it's kind of coming full circle for me that I, I think it's phenomenal because one that's that was a ballsy move for you to make like i really applaud you for being for doing that because i kind of look upon the route that i've taken to get to where i am now and i'm like i wish i had done that like i wish I, there was someone that i could just be like i will i will scrub your toilet i will do everything and anything i possibly can just to be around you to learn and soak up what you've got but it was funny because it, actually last week it was a bit of a slap in the face um, to all the feedback that I got actually being in the mastermind and everyone was like, look, you're doing such a great job, but your businesses are scaling at such a route. You need to be the team. Like you need to be the CEO from now on. And I'm like, oh my God, like I really need to, I need to bring on some real A game players. And it's actually funny. So by the time this podcast will all, would have been released. I would have already um, kind of like launched out and told everyone who's coming on board, but I've already got two top quality coaches that I'm actually going to pay for to live over here in Bali with me. And hopefully a third, I've actually got to finish the interview later this week. So I'm looking to bring on exactly what you're saying to have a couple of people being able to help. I want to help groom their online businesses and grow their futures, but in the same token, they can help me with doing everything that I need in my businesses. So I think anyone listening right now, the apprentice is not a dirty word by any means i think it's actually the easiest and fastest way to be able to go out and learn what you need i agree i think it um you know it's kind of a funny like it, it has this weird connotation now but for hundreds and hundreds of years that that was how kind of careers developed right like 
uh, went and you worked in an apprenticeship for four to seven years in, you know, Europe or colonial America. I'm, I'm not sure how it worked in Australia, but you worked for someone that kind of understood what the game was. And then they, you understood the game, you made connections and relationships, which is something else I didn't mention that a big part of what helped me in the launch of the book was actually the relationships um, I was able to make as an apprentice that because I had, you know, I had $20,000 in marketing budget to play with. Um, I could go out to other entrepreneurs running um, businesses and say, Hey, you know, I, I work, I run the marketing for this business. And um, I just spent $120,000 in marketing over the last six months. And I know what works. Like, would you like me to tell you? Mm. Um, and they were like, yeah, sure. Let's grab lunch. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I was able to make relationships with those kind of people because I had, I had valuable information and things I could, you know, contribute and share with them. And a lot of those people, you know, supported, uh, have supported me since then and, and done a lot to help me. I think it's great. Okay. So I really want to transition over now. This is going to be a bit of a head snapping turn in the interview. And I want to really talk about your actual success as an author and how you've done this in the the systems, the failures, the successes that you've gone through to actually get to this point now, because as we were talking just before we hit record, you're actually about to pop off from Thailand to New York to start talking about the next book and uh, being able to bring on some people to help you be able to do that. What has been a couple of the absolute, okay, I didn't know about this process of being an author until you actually got into it? I think one thing I was actually thinking about this earlier today is there's something about um, being an author and having a book that is just, it's a real access point and it just has a certain like um, status and air of prestige, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. I, I was yeah. listening to this interview with Reed Hoffman. I mentioned this um, in the presentation and Reed, you know, he introduced himself as an author and entrepreneur. And I thought that was so interesting because, you know, he could have picked any high status word on earth, right? Like, billionaire, co-founder of PayPal, founder of LinkedIn. Um, like he, there's no word he, he probably couldn't have picked. He should have you know, just said like, Bola. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it wouldn't have been, you know, hyperbole if he'd introduced himself as a baller. It's like, yeah, fair enough. Um, but, but he, he picked author. author. Yeah. And I think that's kind of interesting that there is um, something about a book which which yields itself to that. And I think, you know, not undeservingly, there's something about having, you know, kind of your main philosophy or your main framework in this, you know, 40, 50, 80,000 word um, book, which communicates something significant about how you see the world. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of been the biggest thing for me that, you know, I had, I had a hundred blog posts or articles I'd written on my site and my sister called me after the book came out and she's like, oh, I read it and it's good. And she was crying. And like, my <laughs> first thought was like, I wrote like a quarter million words in blog posts. Like not you know, hear one word from you and like one book and you call me and you're going to cry. Um, but you know, I, I don't know. And I don't know why that is, but that does seem to be the case. It's a, it's a really, uh, I think, okay, you've hit that out of the park because um, I recently interviewed the the listener would have known from a previous episode with Tucker Max. And he was saying the exact same thing. The book gives you that level of authority that it stems from generations ago, because obviously authors from years back didn't have the easy entry point. It is as today to be able to make that happen, but it still definitely gives you that that real step up from everybody else that I think is so powerful. Um, the other thing that you touched on that also Tucker actually said as well in his interview was obviously you have to start with a good book. Like there's no way of getting around it. You can't, you can't write some cruddy, do you know what I mean? A couple of blog posts thrown together and expect it to kind of sell and give you the authority in the marketplace that you're aiming for. What are the other keys to making this work? So I think really the big things, if I'm looking back on the book that were successful, um, one is kind of this notion of building community. Um, so I, I've called this like Jesus marketing, that if you look at what the way, you know, Jesus initially spread religion or how re religion initially spread, they start with very, very small groups and go on to have very, very big impacts, but they concentrate a lot of that initial um, focus on a very, very small group, right? So, you know, you know, without saying anything about the religion, but just kind of <laughs> the mechanics of the marketing. Yeah. Um, he had, you know, had 12 disciples, a very, very small group, which he invested basically most of his time, you know, talking with them and working with them. And they went on to, to spread the message. Um, that, that was kind of the same mechanics that worked out for me with marketing the book, which is, you know, I set up this landing page about six months before the book came out and invited people to, you know, say, okay, opt in here and I'll send you um, a free copy of the book, or you can send them a, a few free chapters. 
chapters when they're ready. Uh, and then I'd like to ask you to join a Facebook group. And then those people in that Facebook group kind of became my core community. They gave me feedback on um, how to design the cover, what to use as the title. And then also were early readers and editors for the book. So they read early versions of the book and gave me feedback. And so not only did that make the product better, you know, I ended up with a stronger title, a better cover, uh, a better edited book. And if I hadn't done that, those people were also um, involved in the book. Um, and so when it came out, they mm. were very supportive mm. um, of spreading the word about the book because in a very real way, they kind of owned part of the book. Like they actually they actually made it and like, you know, this was the paragraph they suggested I write yeah. kind of thing. I think it's beautiful. Like, so Jesus's disciples or Taylor's disciples are kind of your early adopters and they're your, they're your true fans. Like kind of getting the people that are then going to be able to obviously become a part of that community. I think it's a great thing that you've done. You, you got them so a part of the process that they obviously were able and very willing to when the book launch did come about. They were the ones that I definitely would have assumed, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they're the ones actually going out and preaching preaching the word of Taylor in your book and being able to help push the sales and push the kind of the leads coming in from it as well. I, yeah, I hesitate to extend the religion analogy. I don't know if they, <laughs> hopefully they weren't preaching. Um, That's why yes, I wanted I to think, use it. <laughs> yeah. Um, they did, you know, I, I kind of had this moment two days after the book came out, I had all these like forums I was going to go post in and Facebook groups. And I was going to like, you know, write about the book, all these places. And I, I kept like going down my list and I would go to the next place. Um, and I would see that someone in that Facebook group had already gone in there and posted for me. Wow. So, I mean, not only were they doing the work for me, uh, which was amazing and, and very generous of them. Um, but it's a much more powerful recommendation, right? If I come in there and say, Hey, you know, come, you know, download my book or come buy my book. It's like, eh, yeah, yeah. Like get out of here. Like it's kind of annoying. But if someone else says, Hey, this guy just launched this book and it's really good. And I think you should read it. It's like, yeah. okay, well, you know, I'll check it out. Like it's a third party recommendation. You've got some very um, powerful social proof from that. That's obviously really what's going to help sell the books. Yes, I was. Um, you know, I, I spent most of actually the week after the book launch not doing much marketing, but just writing thank you notes to people. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, so that was that was very cool to see, and that was, and you know, of course, having generous readers helps. Okay, so one awesome takeaway from this already is definitely being able to build a following and get people a part of the process of the actual book before it comes to launch date. So you've already got a solid plan in place as when you're writing it, going through the drafts, the editing process. Process on this side gig, you're building up this following as well. What's something else that the listener can take away from that was it really a great learning point from you going through this? So let me add, I'll add one tactical thing to give people like a clear takeaway. Um, in that Facebook group, what I would do is I would post weekly updates and I would say like, okay, I edited this section of the book and I did this to the title and I did this to the cover. So they could see the progress very clearly and then people would give feedback on those and then I would take hmm. their feedback and actually do it. Um, and so like that process was very much what got people involved. Um, so if you can do something specific like that, like I think Facebook groups work really well. I'm sure there's other ways to do it. Um, but like kind of that, that's the specific tactic that I was using um, that was really effective. What um, would be more of a strategy, an overall strategy that we could start to implement as well? Because that tactic's beautiful. So uh, the other thing I found that was really helpful was thinking about the book as a business instead of as a book. So I think, you know, I, I love books. I love to read. I've always loved to read. Uh, and so I think I had this kind of um, almost sacred notion of books where I wasn't kind of applying my business mind to writing the book initially. Um, and I, I read a book um, that a friend recommended to me about how to market, um, like kind of basic book marketing for authors. So for people that don't have any marketing background, like this book was like, okay, uh, it was called a thousand, sell your first 1,000 copies. Like here's, you know, how you can sell your first 1,000 copies of the book. And I read the book and I was doing marketing consulting at the time. So people were paying me uh, to give them advice about how to do their marketing. And I read this book, which is basically like, you know, online marketing 101 for authors. And I was like, I know how to do all this stuff better than this author, um, or at least as well as this author, and I'm not actually doing it. I'm not actually applying to the book. Um, and so when I kind of changed that around, it led to a couple um, seemingly obvious things, which were kind of balancing between um, product and marketing. So I said, like, you know, I was basically just sitting there and writing and saying, okay, like, when I get done writing it, then I'll start telling people. But I'm spending 50% of my time working on the book and 50% of my time working on the marketing. So that was stuff like getting people in the Facebook group, um, writing articles or blog posts on my site, which had excerpts about the book or my writing process. 
um, or kind of you know, things going on with the book or going on other podcasts and talking about the book coming out. So I started thinking about it like as a business where, you know, you got to spend half your resources on product development and half your resources on marketing. Um, and the other thing thinking about like a business did is let me kind of like apply some basic um, rules about startups, one of which is like, you know, can you iterate quickly? So um, instead of like, okay, I'm just going to sit in my hole and write this book for nine months, I ended up setting milestones and then kind of like doing mini launches of the book. So I wrote a rough draft where it took me about um, two and a half months and I released that to five people. So just a very, very small group and got their feedback. And then um, I went through and I wrote another draft and I posted sections of that draft onto my site. And I sent that draft out to about a hundred people. I said, okay, you know, give me feedback on this. And then I went through and then I did the final draft and I released the final draft to my readers, but I was able to kind of go through a few iterations and like let people see the book um, and market test, quote unquote, um, yeah. the book before it actually came out, which most authors can't do. Certainly traditionally published authors, from my understanding, yeah. don't have that luxury. This is this is some really powerful stuff, and I hope the listeners really being able to soak this up because the process you're going through is obviously content repurposing as you're going through, which is obviously so powerful because obviously as you're writing the book, absolutely the main idea is obviously to put these words into the book, but there are so many other forms of content and mediums that you can turn this into to then be able to leverage and help the book come along as well and grow that following. And I think as well, what you're being able to show is the process of you don't just focus a hundred percent of your efforts on writing it and then when it's finished writing then go out and try and sell it the process has to be very very synergistic as you're moving along with it as well yeah and i think someone i really took inspiration from um as i think I certainly had this in my head. People think, well, you know, if I if I talk about the book publicly or I post sections of the book publicly, um, well, then yeah, no one will pay me for it. No one will want to read it. And no one will take it seriously. And the Andy Weir, who's the author of a book called The Martian, which you probably heard of, it just I think it's made like four hundred million dollars in the box office. Um, he actually he wrote the first version of that book as a series of blog posts. It was like a syndicated blog where every two weeks he would publish the next chapter. And then his reader said, oh, Andy, this is so good, but our friends won't read it because, um, you know, like they don't know how to read blogs. He's like, okay, well, I'll upload it to Amazon. So he put it to Amazon, uh, I think for like a 99 cent book, and he sold 40,000 copies or something like that, absurd, <laughs> in like the first three months. And then Crown Publishing contacted him and he sold the book rights to Crown Publishing for um, six figures. I don't know exactly how much. And yeah. then someone bought the screenplay and <laughs> it just came out. And it's, you know, so now he's the book, which he's, you know, free public. He's published the whole thing online. Is now a $400 million grossing screenplay. Right. That is a pretty epic story. Okay. That's good. Now, I tell you what, what is, what are some questions that you wish people asked you rather than the usual gibberish that you get when people are wanting to be an author? The first one that popped to mind was, um, yeah, how much does it cost? And not necessarily in money terms, but in time terms, I yeah. think, um, there's a lot. I, th I don't have any like moral ob or objection to people. If like a book is a strategic business thing for, you know, consultants um, can have a very real scenario where if like they have a book and it's just uh, okay, um, they can use that as a business card basically. And it can be worth a hundred thousand dollar consulting gig. And so it makes sense to, you know, go pay a ghostwriter $25,000 to write your book or $50,000 to write your book for you because one consulting gig yeah, um, and it pays for itself. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that's certainly one path. I think if people want to write it themselves, um, I did it in nine months, which from people I've talked to is pretty fast. And I, it was, you know, I had other consulting I was working on at that time, but um, it was definitely the bulk of my kind of creative energy and best energy. Um, so I think just being conscientious of, you know, is this something I'm willing, uh, it's important enough to me to devote um, at least six months, and I think um, nine months to a year or two is probably more realistic. What would you say would be the actual time investment per day or per week during, the, during those nine months? So I would say about 20 hours a week was what I was putting into it over yeah. nine months. And then um, in like the months right around the launch, so the month leading up to the launch and the month after the launch, um, it was all my time. That's awesome. Um, I think that's a really good thing because I think so many people with a whole kind of, okay, I can outsource, I can get ghostwriters to come in, but it's never going to be that true thing of your language or what you want to put across. Also, I like delving into this myself. I kind of want to own the process and enjoy the process as well and learn from it. So I definitely see where you put the hard yakker in 
and you're being able to obviously reap the fruits from that as well. I think it's good for to get get those truths across to the listener as well. I think it's very powerful. Now, in the you brought this up, and I think this is unreal for so many listeners right now. For obviously a professional such as a personal trainer or a lawyer or anyone in those sort of like coaching consultant gigs wanting to use this as a lead generation tool, how do you think you can help them prosper from writing a book? What would be some key points for a lead gen more for more from a book? So I guess one thing I'd really look at is what I mentioned about um, if you're a ghostwrite or record a transcript and have someone do that, I think if you're using it primarily as a lead gen, that's a good option for getting it done. Um, in terms of like what you can do with the marketing, um, I think definitely thinking a lot about just the branding. Um, so having a very, like spending a lot of money um, or a reasonable lot of money on the cover and the cover design and the interior formatting and layout um, and making sure that um, that looks really, um, really good. So, you know, if you like hand it out to prospective clients um, that you, you know, it feels like a real book. Like I was something I, when I handed my book out, you know, it's done through a service called Create Space, which Amazon does where they will print books on demand. Um, so they kind of like had, they have your PDF file and when someone orders a book, it goes to their printer and they print it off and ship it. Um, but it, it looks um, as close as I could get. And I think I've talked to people who didn't even know it was self-published. So oh, I think wow. having that like really professional um, branding uh, element makes a, a big difference if you're using it um, for clients, especially for high-end clients. Um, and I think the other thing is um, if you can um, – kind of put some framework in there that's proprietarily yours. Yes. Particularly in terms of like the language um, and the positioning. So um, like one book I saw recently is by an author named Sally Hogsheads who wrote a book called Fascinate. Yep. Um, and the book's good. It has like a lot of kind of traditional marketing principles. I don't, she, it wasn't an amazingly innovative book, but she like really, she like owned this word fascinate. And she had like, you know, here are the seven keys to fascination and here's why fascination is so important. Um, and I think has done, you know, it's a good book. Um, and I think she's done very, very well with it. And I think a big part of that is she kind of created this language that's hers. You know, when people say, okay, I quite work with Sally, like she is fascinate. Um, like even now when I say, like when people say that word, like I have this image of her come to mind that she's positioned herself and like really owned um this particular angle this particular way of looking at uh marketing yeah i remember listening to an interview of her actually talking about that and that's so true and I'm, i might be wrong on this but she also had kind of the method of driving people back to her site to obviously then go through a bit of a process that she's put together to then to be able to help the construction that she's put around to help people get the best out of that of that whole sort of fascinate scheme i think it's absolutely beautiful yeah, and I think that was something I did. Someone advised me that um, worked really well was having on the when you preview a book on Amazon, you see like the first five pages. So if you'll make the first page the title and the second page um, like an opt in for some bonuses. So, you know, for me, it was like interviews with people featured in the book, um, like some templates um, and tools um, that people who read the book would want to use afterwards. Um, you know, so for example, like, okay, like I just read this book about entrepreneurship, but like, you know, what does this mean? Like, okay, well, here's a planning template, um, for like how you can, you know, like start working on your first entrepreneurial project and like go here. And then that takes people to a page to enter their email to download the templates. And so then you can send them, um, additional emails to see if they're, you know, are they, are they the kind of person that would want to be a client? So start to build your email list through yeah, that. And yeah. Then, um, yeah, like email them relevant information. Absolutely. My, my whole marketing brain kind of sparks up when you say that. And it's obviously a great way to build your list, build your following, and then be able to kind of put them in the right sequences and funnel to then obviously bring them on to not only just buying the book to obviously become customers and clients as well. Right. Beautiful. Okay. Now, Taylor, let's wrap this up because I don't want to steal too much of your time right now. And you've been really generous with dishing this out. What do you think is one more key point that the listener can take away with right now with everything that you've learned bringing this book out? We haven't even named the book yet. I've just realized this. We'll, we'll spill this at the end. What's a one key point? <laughs> yeah, it'll be a real secret. <laughs> Um, so I guess the other thing I would add is um, to be really deliberate, and this is something I, I didn't do that I would have done in retrospect, um, that after the book comes out, um, if you kind of line up the marketing well initially and it has a big splash, there's a really, um, there's a window after that where you have a lot of opportunity to capitalize on. So because the book is very timely, it just came out. Um, and if the marketing goes well, you know, it'll be on some bestseller list on Amazon or you know, something you can point to. And that's a really 
easy time or you're going to have an easier time at least to reach out to traditional media or podcast or blogs and say, hey, you know, I'm the author of this book. It just came out. It's doing really well. I think um, your readers would be interested in the topic. Um, you know, I'd love to like, you know, come talk with your podcast or write an article for your blog. Or that kind of thing. And you have this kind of momentum cycle where, you know, because the book is doing well and it's at the top of some bestseller list, um, you can get outreach to more media, which means the book sells more, which means it stays at the top of bestseller list, which means you get outreach to more media. Mm. You can like kind of have this virtuous cycle. So really um, build up that snowball as it's, it just yeah, gets more powerful and powerful. Thinking about that one to three month at least period after the book comes out to, to like double down on the marketing um, and really, yeah. If you, especially if you're using it for lead generation, like get the most out of the book that you can. Excellent. Okay. Taylor, now, obviously the listener right now is just absolutely on the edge of their seat, wanting to know actually what the book is and more so as well, how do they find out more about you and everything that you're doing? So dish it up. So the, the book is called The End of Jobs. Uh, you can <laughs> I can't uh, believe find you didn't on... say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I, I, uh, it is what it is. No, it was a cliffhanger. Uh, we've, we've had them on the edge of their seat the whole time. This is good. Yeah. Um, so at the end of jobs, you can find the book on Amazon if you're interested. Um, you can also go to my site, which is Taylor Pearson, T-A-Y-L-O-R-P-E-A-R-S-O-N.me. And there's a few free chapters if you want to download the first few chapters of the book for free um, on the homepage. Uh, and then also, uh, by the time this goes live, I will have actually a, a post on the marketing and some more details. So if you want to get awesome. more of the details and download some of the templates, um, those will be available available on the site as well. Just click essays in the top navigation. It should be in that list. Fantastic. I will have direct links to all of those in the show notes so the listener can get straight on over to those on turningproacademy.com. Taylor, I mate, massive thank you for obviously being such a gentleman the whole time and just being so lavish with the insights that you're dishing out. I'm really looking forward to keeping in touch with you, mate, and watching what's coming up. So mate, massive kudos and a massive thank you. Likewise, thanks for having me on and uh, thank you everyone for listening. If you want to become the go-to, the leader and the authority in your business and you want a constant flow of new clients and sales all day every day, go right now to turningproacademy.com. No more hype, BS or wasted time. This is all real world advice and strategies that the world's best use to 10x their businesses, generate more money and get back their time. We'll see you next time on Turning Pro Academy.